Welcome to the Connected Mom Podcast, where we have conversations about connecting more deeply with God, more empathically with our fellow moms, and more intentionally with your child. I'm Becky Harling, your host of the Connected Mom Podcast, and I have with me today my illustrious co-host, Sarah Wildman, who is a mama to two little boys. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Becky. Well, it's so good to be here as always, and I'm I'm very excited about this topic. Let's introduce it. Yeah, me too. Today, we're going to be talking about teen depression, and we know that the statistics are rising. And our guest today is Dr. Jim Coyle. I've known Jim for a number of years, and so I can call him my friend. However, he also has been a professor. He has administrated two intensive out patient treatment programs, which were designed to treat adolescents struggling with addiction. He currently serves on the faculty of Point Loma Nazarene University and Azusa Pacific University, teaching graduate psychology courses in marriage and family therapy. In addition to that, he enjoys time with his wife, Melinda, who I know, who's lovely, and his daughters, Haley and Katie. And, okay, get this, guys. He does does celebrity impersonations, ah. and he's also <laughs> been involved in musical theater. He recently played the role of Maurice, Belle's dad, for oh. Beauty and the Beast. I mean, even if we weren't going to talk about depression, Jim, I might have you on to just act out Maurice, because I love that show. Welcome, Jim. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. It's good to be here with you and Sarah. Appreciate being here. Yeah, it's it's great to have you here. So today we're going to talk about teenage depression. And Jim, you wrote an article that I read in LinkedIn about the rise in teenage depression. And we know that it's huge right now. And so moms that are listening right now, if you have a teenager and you're not sure, I really want to invite you to lean in, maybe grab a notebook and take some notes on what Jim says, because I have a feeling this is going to be really profound. So Jim, what are you seeing as far as the rise of teenage depression, and why do you think that's happening? Well, um, I don't just base my opinion on, I mean, obviously you look for trends, uh, what we experience in our office when we, when we meet with teenagers. But we also look for research and there's no one really one identifiable factor that explains why it's uh, rising amongst teenagers but we are seeing there's a number of studies that point to factors such as social media use a lack of coping skills uh, academic and social pressure uh, it really has been on the rise and been a public health problem even before the pandemic uh, you know from 2013 to 2019 teenagers in the united states uh, had experienced episodes, uh, one in five teenagers experienced episodes of major depression. And then the suicide rates amongst young people between the ages of 10 to 24 has in increased by 57% between uh, 2007 to 2018. Um, however, we do think the pandemic has had a significant effect, um, primarily related to what we call COVID-related grief. and. Um, it's, it's not talked about, I don't see it much in the news, but between April, 20, April 2020 to June of 2021, more than 140,000 uh, US children lost a primary or secondary caregiver um, because of the pandemic. And we know that parental loss during childhood can lead to depression uh, later in youth or later in life. So, uh, but the pandemic also introduced other stressors, including isolation from their peers, um, remote learning, and the economic burdens it placed on families, which could have, uh, you know, created dynamics that um, would facilitate depression or may have intensified may have something that may have already been there. So um, there's a number of factors. There is a wonderful uh, resource, too, um, that shows the impact of uh, social media and smartphones by Dr. Jean Twinge, Twinge, mm -hmm. T-W-E-N-G-E. She is a, uh, a researcher at San Diego State University who wrote the book, iGen, and basically showing the research that the most connected uh, generation, 
you know, the generation that's grown up with social media and smartphones actually reports the highest uh, incidence of loneliness and disconnection. Mm. Wow. So, Jim, as parents, what is the definition of depression? What are the kind of things that parents should be looking out for with a teen? I mean, I think a lot of us have an idea like, oh, they're sad or, or something. But what are those symptoms, I guess, that you're looking for when we talk about depression? Well, there's a number of warning signs and, and symptoms that therapists usually look for are, uh, you know, the client reporting that they have been feeling sad or depressed pretty much every day for um, no less than 30 to 30 days or longer. You know, we can have a funk, we can have what we call the blues, but it doesn't usually, uh, we can go through, you know, down spells, but don't necessarily meet the criteria for major depression. But usually when you see that for 30 days or longer, and with that is, uh, you know, tearfulness or crying, uh, expressions of feeling hopeless, uh, maybe withdrawal from social or family relationships, isolation, uh, usually a loss of pleasure in the things that they once enjoyed, the thing that they actually got them going in the day or they were looking forward to, they don't seem to be engaging in that or not even expressing much of an interest in it. Um, you also look for change in sleep patterns. Um, so they may be undersleeping or oversleeping or waking up during the night. Any changes in appetite, um, increased eating or actually a, a reduction in eating. Uh, and with that comes some, you know, usually some significant weight changes. But, uh, and then restlessness um, and the lack of enthusiasm, a decrease or a total lack of enthusiasm or motivation. Those are all warning signs. Um, difficulty thinking, concentrating. Uh, usually it's because they're preoccupied with depressing or morbid thoughts. Uh, they can have thoughts, and, and these, this is not unlike what adults might experience too. I'm trying to not think about whatever those thoughts are, and I can just become overwhelmed and actually almost mm -hmm. disconnect because I'm so preoccupied with whatever these depressing thoughts are. Um, feelings of guilt, shame, or worthlessness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those are not being expressed or certainly felt, but sometimes they can be observed just by seeing the shift in the way your child's behaving. Uh, and with that, because uh, their mind is so preoccupied with some of these things that actually has physiological effects. So they can have increased fatigue and low energy um, and then have frequent complaints about physical symptoms. They might be complaining mm -hmm. more about their stomach aching or headaches or being tired all the time. And those could be actually physical symptoms that they're experiencing. It also could be a way for them to somaticize because maybe expressing that they're depressed isn't okay with them, you know, it comes with a certain amount of stigma. So some people will actually be more concerned about going to see a doctor for a stomach ache or a headache that are happening all the time versus saying, I've really been feeling depressed and low for quite a while. Mm. So as moms, Jim, we, uh, when we see those signs, I mean, we're tempted to like completely freak out, mm -hmm. right? And, and panic, and yet that's probably not the most helpful response. <laughs> it, it, one of the things that you talked about in your article was to open the conversation, but my question to you is how? I mean, how do you get your kid talking about this kind of stuff when maybe they have completely shut down or they've isolated in their room and they don't wanna converse? Well, one of the things I think before is having a little mental, uh, some little preparation. And one is to, uh, tell my parents to remember what being a teen is like. Um, mm. You know, that could be one of the things is that sometimes we're pathologizing things that are actually quite normal. But, but remember what it was like to be a teen. That is a time of change, uh, first job, learning mm -hmm. to drive, you know, um, maybe spending less time with parents, maybe having their first, you know, crush or relationship uh, and all that. And remember the brain is still developing. We know the frontal lobe that is executive functioning and, you know, gives us the the discernment about whether we should do something or not isn't fully developed um, until we're 25. So just, you know, and also our social media can have a, a significant impact on our teens' lives. We're noticing the research is showing that for young women, it's correlated with uh, body dissatisfaction as well as anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem. 
that doesn't mean that I haven't seen that impact young men too. Um, I got a call from a friend saying, who do I, uh, who can I have my son see because he, his, the way he feels about himself uh, rises and falls depending on how many likes he got on some kind of photo, photo or mm. post he made. So um, it can make them feel anxious. Um, social media it can make them feel anxious about a lack of approval or fear of missing out, things like that. But I think one of the things too is before you have that conversation, you know, watch for some of the cues that we talked about. Um, one of the cues can be, um, they might be bringing up mental health topics on their own. Um, they may mention a friend who's going through something uh, that they might be feeling themselves and just asking them what that's like for them and asking them mm. if they've had experiences like that themselves. Watch for those cues that are kind of um, openings. Um, there are certain things that clients or your children will say that can create an opening for a conversation. And, um, and then asking them general questions about what's going on in their life, uh, what it feels, um, how they're feeling, what, what are they experiencing. Uh, and once you've begun that dialogue with your teen, um, your teen must really believe that um, you're hearing what they're telling you and you're recognizing the importance of it. So validating their feelings is really important. Uh, minimizing their feelings is not going to work. Well, that's silly. Well, why should you feel that way? Look how, how pretty you are. Look how handsome you are. You've got all these things going for you. Uh, that doesn't, I mean, when somebody's depressed, they may, they may know that. Um, you know, you may have had your own experience. And sometimes I tell my parents, or, you know, you may, have you ever had an experience where maybe you went through a, a season where you weren't feeling so well, and it might have been because of some significant uh, situation in your life, and people are pouring into you all these wonderful accolades. And uh, uh, my own experience with that is I realized it just didn't sit because it, there was a hole in my bucket, right? <laughs> it can just pour right out and we can't hear it mm -hmm. because we're going through this really challenging period. So the other thing too is to try and listen without judgment. And mm -hmm. this will help your child relax and open up. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it can make them feel like it's okay to come to you just by, if you just remain calm and open, um, that can establish a level of trust. And if you're not sure how to bring the topic up, uh, consider watching a movie. You can watch a movie that maybe deals with this topic or some other program as a starting point and choose a time when they're not tired or stressed out and watch the program together. Uh, and then ask some open questions like, how are you feeling about it? Or what are you thinking about it? Um, you can do that without a movie or something like that, but certainly that can be an entry point too. Um, uh, and if they're not open to talking right away, let them know that you're there for them when they have, when they're ready. Uh, mm. This, this is what we call it. It's somewhat paradoxical. Uh, I don't want to talk about this right now. Um, well, I'm really interested, but, um, I'll, I'll, how about I'm here when you're ready to talk about it. And, um, you kind of force the issue that oftentimes will bring up resistance. And we know that even Jesus said, you know, I stand at the door and knock, right? If any man opens the door, I'll come in. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't bust the door down. So sometimes the only time I would ever be intensive or really say we need to, to do this at some point is if there's some serious indications that they're, they're really uh, in need of help right away. Um, but, you know, but you want to remind them it's okay to ask for help and that asking for help is not a sign of being weak. Just jumping in there, Jim, on asking for help, something we've talked about in other episodes of The Connected Mom is, of course, having the, the skills that you've talked about, you know, listening well, <laughs> keeping that conversation open. But when... Um, when you realize that maybe this is beyond you, right? And, and your parenting skills, um, what should parents do? What should they do when professional help is, looks like it's probably what they need to bring in as their team? Well, I think probably the first step would be calling a, um, a licensed uh, mental health professional. Uh, maybe it's a licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed clinical social worker, psychologist. 
uh, and reaching out and just getting validation for some of the concerns that you're seeing and expressing to them. And usually they will encourage that you meet uh, with them sooner rather than later and bring your team with them, with you, to have that conversation. And how does that work in introducing the idea to your teen? <laughs> That's another story I'm thinking. I was like, okay, th this is a big deal, right? And, and and you're trying to control yourself as a mom. I'm I'm thinking about this in the, you know, and then introducing this idea that a stranger, you know, might be able to help. Do you have any tips on that? Well, part there, of the there are times when um, young people, it's, they want to feel normal like anybody else. They're, they're, um, just like adults, uh, they want to be normal. They may deny that they have depression. It's very, very common. They may push back on it. But one of the things you can say is I'm, I'm concerned because, and you can express your observations of their behavior without judging them. I don't know what this is, mm. but this is what I've seen. And you give them specific examples and it doesn't have to be, you overwhelm them with a ton of them. It can be some specific examples of what you've seen and what that, what that, how that raises a concern for you. Uh, and especially if you have more than, you know, one parent, you know, if you've got a couple of people, if you've got another sibling that says, you know, Jake, I'm concerned because, you know, I know you've said a few things about, you know, uh, you know, I'm just going to, you know, things will be better off when I'm not here. Right? Mm -hmm. Comments like that, and, you know, you've made comments that make me wonder if you're thinking about killing yourself. And so I want you to go see someone. So sometimes an intervention like that, or the other thing too is, um, this is, I want us to go together because this is something, at least I want an outside observer to, to see if there's anything that we need to be concerned about. And I'd mm -hmm. like for us to go together and talk about this because this is beyond, this is, I would do this if you had a broken leg. If you're home and you protested when you were little, you can, sometimes they won't like that <laughs> stories about when they were little. You did not want to go to the doctor, you know? Uh, you, you know, I don't want to go to the doctor. You know, I don't want to get this, this, you know, cut or something help. But this is, this is outside of my ability to help you with. So what if they flat out refuse, Jim? What well, if they just if they, say, I'm not going to go? If you, they flat out refuse, one of the things I encourage um, parents to do is go without your team. Go make an appointment with a therapist without your team because that therapist can coach you on effective ways to um, res respond to the situation, to the child. But oftentimes it actually creates a little bit of curiosity on the part of the child. Because mm. sometimes they'll say, well, you know what, I think I want to go so I can share my side of the story. Yeah. So it's also yeah, that's good. Be kind of an indirect hook. So if teams are watching this, they go, oh, this guy's, don't go to this guy. But <laughs> I don't know that they will be, but I mean, that, that, is, that is part one, you go for yourself because you need, I have a lot of people who come see me, they go, hey, I want to, um, I want to come see you because I want to get my husband to stop drinking. And I'll say, um, well, I, I, that would be great. Is your husband going to come? Oh, no, he's not going to come. Well, I can help you know how to respond differently to a husband with just like that. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility it creates a conversation where he'd be willing to come in and maybe address the issue. So the same thing is true with, with seeking counseling without your teen. Um, that would be an effective thing, I think, would be I, the, the, very often the teen yeah. will follow. So yeah. I have a question for you, Jim. Let's backtrack a little bit. Like, what about the mom's that don't have teens yet maybe they have 10 year olds like maybe they're in that 10 to 12 category that tween category mm -hmm. what can they do now to kind of help a little bit so that maybe their kids can avoid the whole depression thing in teen years is there anything they can do or is it just kind of like a well maybe it'll happen maybe it won't i don't know well certainly we know that uh parental involvement is um, it goes a long way to reducing mm -hmm. parental involvement uh, by both parents is a significant factor, whether the uh, kids being exposed to things that they uh, might enjoy. That might mean, you know, um, that doesn't mean that they might take up everything. I had my daughters, uh, uh, I was 
very active tennis player at one time, and I had them go to tennis lessons thinking they may just decide they want to be play tennis. <laughs> they did not. I, I exposed them to being soccer. It was very clear to me that, that Haley, when she uh, was content just to kind of hang out by the goal, you know, she, you know, you, you yeah. could see the little kids when those early, they're all around the ball and everything. And she's like, well, I don't care too much about that ball, but you know. Yeah, we had one like that too. Right? <laughs> yeah. And you expose them to maybe dance or, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, some of the, uh, some of the things that maybe the school can provide, but anything um, involved, those kind of things can be helpful too. I wanna make sure I understand your question, right? So that's one of them is what can I do to be maybe prevent any um, occurrence of depression? Is that what your question was? Yeah, just kind of like, how do we help them? I mean, I know that there can be a genetic predisposition towards depression, um, but but I wonder if there were steps that parents can take to kind of, st you know, so that their child feels more connected and more uh, positive about life in their tween years, especially because I I think those years can be a little bit rough too before the teen years, you know. Well, I think that uh, see involvement affirmation. Um, affirmation yeah, I like goes a that. long ways. Um, we do know that teens, it is a part of where they're beginning this separation, right? Hopefully at some point later, parents are effectively able to launch their child, right? But we also know when there's a lack of acceptance um, or emotional availability at home, usually youth will become more peer dependent to mm. derive their self-esteem from. Does that make sense? So yeah. it doesn't mean that peers aren't important, you know, it, that they're, but they will, when there's a lack of acceptance or love and nurturing at home, they'll seek that outside of the home. So they'll yeah. seek that, they're more likely to be dependent on peer approval, no matter what form that takes. I mean, I, I knew guys back in high school they got a lot of approval for doing some really crazy stuff I and mean, high yeah. risk behavior. Uh, and they got a lot of applause and everybody knew this was not okay. But I, now I know that they were vulnerable to seeking that because they weren't getting uh, much of uh, much attention at home. We have a saying that negative attention is better than no attention at all. And so, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's it's that's important. That means it doesn't mean you have to hover over your child all the time. It yeah, just, like the helicopter. Mom. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you and Melinda. I mean, I knew you back uh, when we were all living out in California, and um, I believe I'm correct. You were both working while you were raising the kids, mm -hmm. and yet your kids felt really connected to you well, so talk about that balance a little bit because a lot of the moms that are listening are like oh no maybe now I need to quit my job and stay home and you know do the whole homeschool thing and maybe that's not what they've been called to do right so how how do you keep that connection when both parents really need to work well, maybe I've, I've, I've thought about this over the time um, I lost my mom uh, last year and my mom was a mm. maverick her day, she was a maverick. She was a working mother when it was really socially unacceptable to be a working mother. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. I think it was in high school, I learned later that some of the grief that my mom got from women in the church or women on our neighborhood and stuff like that, but she was so involved in our lives. And so there, if there, hopefully, whatever, um, uh, whatever the mother's occupation is, she is able to somehow be intentional about those times, uh, the quality time piece with, with that they are emotionally available to their child in some fashion. Uh, they still are able to carve out time to go to their games or go to their um, dance recitals or whatever that is. And so um, mm. I, I, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I do know that, that it's much more common for uh, to w women to work outside of the home now more than ever, especially yeah. more than it was back in when my mom was doing it. And I think that that was, uh, that was a pattern that I've seen other women, uh, I'm not just saying my mom was the only one that did that. I know that 
uh, my wife has been very intentional about being involved in my uh, daughter's lives, and uh, I like to think I am too. But I know that she's the she's the first one they call. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah, talk, yeah. When they want to talk about something, yeah. it doesn't mean they don't talk to me. They do. But I think that is an important thing. How can I be intentional about knowing my, that, my, um, that my child believes are seen and heard? We all have that desire to be seen and heard. And um, how can I do that? Yeah, I love that. I think um, I love the emphasis on the word intentional because I think... Um, I think there can be a lot of guilt for working moms and yet there are a lot of moms that stay home perhaps that maybe aren't intentional. So I think whether you're working or whether you are a stay at home mom or whether you're working from home, the key is intentionality, you know, and really connecting with your child. I, I think one of the things that was a priority to Steve and I, when we were raising our kids, um, was to really know their friends and their mm. coaches and who were the people really speaking into their lives, you know? And so um, I know it can be inconvenient at times for parents, you know, but we tried to have our home always be open, you know? And sometimes it was crazy, right? But we <laughs> wanted the kids in our home because then we knew a little bit about what was going on. So when we had teens, I could tell you all of their friends, and so could Steve, and that was important to us. Yeah, that's a great point. You know? That is an excellent point. Uh, be the be the be the cool cool parent. Now, I will say, cool parents, you got to be careful with that because I've worked with teens who said, "My parents were cool; they smoked pot with me." Right? Yeah, right. Oh, and then those same kids, those same kids, two weeks later would say, "My parents aren't cool because they never proved." Oh, yeah. Any I mean, we weren't structure. cool parents. But, we just knew their but, friends. <laughs> but you knew them. But the other thing, too, is um, we actually gave some thought about putting a pool in the backyard because we wanted to mm, our, let's yes. have them come here. Your house. But we didn't, yeah. we didn't do, do with that kind of expense. But if you can create an environment where um, they're, you, they think they can have fun at your home, you know, watch movies, you know, um, have slumber parties or something like that at an early age, then they more yeah. have to bring their friends around and want you to know their friends. And when you go to the school, yeah. I, there's one more point where I realize we're almost out of time, but there's one more point. I, I mean, I could talk about this topic for hours, but we don't have hours. And I, I know that the moms are leaning in to listen, Jim, what, what, what part would you say prayer for your kids plays in this whole realm of mental illness, fear, anxiety, depression, you know, how does prayer help us as moms help our kids, you know? Wow. <laughs> that I'd say it, uh, it's so important. Um, I think it's, it's a weapon. I don't even know if it weapons the right word, but in our arsenal that I don't know how non-believers, um, bear when their child goes through a period of depression, or uh, mm. I think it also allows us to have some discretion about um, asking for wisdom about, because you're gonna find people within this field that may propose things that just don't feel to fit right with might, uh, what might be best for your child. But I do think that prayers are so important, especially if they, if your children have witnessed you praying and knowing how you believe about prayer, then they're more apt to use that as a way for them to combat feelings of sadness or depression that may be preventative of them going into a period of depression. But the other thing too, is we gotta be careful not to over-spiritualize depression. There were, what was it? There was yeah. a prophet that got depressed, right? In the scripture. And we know David got, went through periods where uh, that he was, you know, very, very low. So we got to be careful, but prayer is very, very important in terms of praying for our kids yeah. uh, and them being aware that prayer is something that they can enlist when they're struggling with something, um, much like we do. Yeah, I love that, Jim. Speaking of prayer, we are out of time. Um, I love everything you said. I hope that you moms that were listening took notes. But Jim, before I close us out would you just pray now 
especially for the moms who have teens in the home and after hearing you, they're like, yeah, I am seeing some of those signs. Would you just pray for them? Sure. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that for among your many attributes and names, one of them is Wonderful Counselor. And Lord, right now, there are those who may be listening that are concerned about their child experiencing maybe early signs of depression or maybe uh, worsening signs of depression. I want to pray that you will come near them, use this broadcast, and provide them other resources in their community they can reach out to uh, to support them in having these conversations and getting them uh, the support and the help that their child may need. Lord, we thank you that um, there's no stigma with depression in your world and in your church. We thank you that you are very familiar with depression. We know that you've grown in agony. You've experienced everything we can imagine. And so you love us and you care for us in ways that we've only just have a glimpse of understanding. And I pray, Lord, that you will come near these women these mothers and provide them the resources that they need to get them help that, the, that they, their child most desperately needs at this time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Jim, thanks so much for being with us. You've been listening today on the Connected Mom podcast, and we hope you'll join us next week for another episode. And if you like today's episode or you know a friend that might need this episode, would you share that on your social media? And join us next time for the Connected Mom podcast. Mm-hmm.